what you said. So today we're going to talk about translation philosophies, interpretations, corruption. We've talked about translation some already, but uh, primarily our uh, primarily our uh, what we've been looking at is uh, transmission. Transmission being copies and copies and copies and so forth. So we talked about translation some, but we're going to talk about translation uh, even more in more detail uh, today. So as we talk about translation, we talk about you know back Jerome in the fourth century, the Latin Vulgate, uh, Wycliffe translating into English from Latin, uh, and of course Luther translated into German, and then Tinsdale. Uh, translated from the Hebrew and Greek to English. So all these are translations, and we're going to be talking about some of those today. I found this online not long ago, and talking about bias, uh, this, uh, well, when I say online, I should say this is on Facebook, and it had uh, all these scriptures, and they're in the KJV, but they're not in any of these others. And it is, I mean, it's just bias, it's just, if it's not King James, look at that, they've taken all of these out. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later on. We're going to be talking about, as we get closer to the end of this class uh, today, uh, King James Version, and the pros and the cons of the, the King James Version. So just remember that this King James Version was written in 1611, and look at all the, the uh, findings that we've had since then, which are not in... Not, not even available at the time the King James was written. And so those are just kind of repeat, repeat slides. So I want to talk about translation philosophies. Uh, there's formal equivalents and there's dynamic equivalents. The formal equivalents are things like formal correspondence. Formal, I mean, uh, one of the things that I think that we can, even in lots of things that we do, is try to forget some of the formality. Not to, not, I'm not saying don't give God the reverence, but do it in a in a not so formal way. It's a word, more word for word, phrase for phrase. Yep. Prepositional clause, if there's a, a prepositional phrase, if it's a prepositional phrase, it's trying to preserve kind of the grammar right. in the wording. Right. But that's very difficult to do going from some languages. Yeah. For example, I mean, as he said, word for word, literal, uh, transparent to originals, transfers interpretation, and, and, and accurate. And of course, accurate is important. And, but if you look at dynamic, then it's things like functional equivalence. I mean, the equivalence from a functional point of view. What's the point? What am I trying to make? Rather than the specific words, what, what's the point I'm trying to get across? And thought for thought. In other words, the thinking, what was meant by this, rather than, you can't even translate it literally, word for word. I mean, there are, there are languages that, I mean, you translate from this language to another one, and the words don't even exist. So, uh, well, the semantic overlap of these words differ. So, when you go from a word in one language to another, right. you may have a word to word translation, but we've got a totally different semantic range of right. word. And you can easily misunderstand the text because you assume a, a meaning for this word that got used to translate it that's not what was really intended. Just very that, and you've got to come up with a phrase to explain it instead of a single word. So that's all this dynamic idea. Readable. Make it more readable. Readable. Replicates experience. Interpretation is built in. Easy to understand. So, I mean, there's a, lots of positive things for this dynamic. There are good things for the formula as well. But a lot of positive things for the dynamics. So this is an online. You can get this online. And I have the, the link up there so you can get it. But looking at the spectrum, all the way from word to word to thought for thought and even paraphrase. Uh, and you can see that underneath the, uh, the uh, translations, various translations, and all the translations obviously are not even on there. But you, you can think about word for word, and you look at this side, and thought for a thought, this side, and so you see the spectrum from one side to the other in all these different uh, uh, translations. Here's a, 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 another online you can find, and it's much the same thing, but again, if you say word for word, and then thought for thought, and you can see how it develops. And as a, as a study strategy, your best approach is to take 
about three or four of these and read them all kind of together at the same time. So, exactly. So you, you, you get some paraphrase, which is more of this dynamic equivalent. You get some of your more formal, like the NASV uh, or the EVS or the KJV. Yeah. Yeah. And then some that are kind of in the middle, the NIV, and, and maybe even Greek and linear if you have enough expertise and you don't have to have a whole lot to be able to go back and pick individual Greek words and try to go back and see what they're trying to say. But you put all those three, three or four different types together and you will get a better picture yeah. than just picking one. And that's one of the most important things I want to say about this is don't choose one and just stick with it, do or die. I mean, there you can look at all, uh, not all of them, but several, I mean, and, and I've, I've got, uh, I'm going to show you a little bit later, my favorites. Yeah, uh, years ago, we bought a study Bible that had four different translations yeah. in it. Side by side. Side by side, you know, one column, one translation. I mean, and you could literally go across in. They don't it's make those yeah, they do too. Anymore. They do too. Yeah. This right here, this right here replaces all. Yeah, so that's true. Online, <laughs> online, you can pull up 15 different translations for the same verse all at the same time. Yeah. But let's put all this together in, let's say, a Venn diagram. Translations should be rated on the following scale in this order. I don't know where I got this. Maybe I don't think I made it up, but I think it's pretty good. Accuracy is pretty important, but just accurate. But you also want readability. Elegance is also a good thing. And so you kind of put that together in that Venn diagram. Readability and accuracy can be found there. But if you can add elegance in there as well, then that's fine. So that sweet point is the best and uh, the better way uh, to look at it. Most discussions we've had so far has been on transmission, copy, copy, copy. But it's not so easy. Start with changing what? From There's multiple variants, even in the fragments. So what are you copying? Make sure you're copying the right thing. Now we're talking about translation. Changing to, uh, to the language of the reader's understanding. And it's critically important, but it's not so easy, as we have mentioned already. Word for word is not really uh, as easily done as, as it sounds. And so that's just kind of an overview of... Uh, putting all this together in, in one uh, frame. And this this middle is not cheap. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's a translator saying that's misogynistic to yeah. a large extent, that that is that a beautiful translation <laughs> yeah. is like a woman. It's not. <laughs> so, and, and, and a faithful <laughs> translation is likely not to use a good head turn. So I, I, <laughs> I'm going to get you out of here. <laughs> so, but back, but back to the original point. Yeah, that's that's still the aim. I mean, if you can get that one little sweet spot, that's the aim. You call the faith one is likely not attainable. Yeah, Diane. If you start studying the Bible with someone and they've never had any basic religious background, you might as well forget it if you study, try to study with some of the harder, like King James yeah, exactly. or whatever. You need an easy to read yeah. uh, version. And I mean, it, that's one of the most important things about trying to get a study with someone that has never really known church or Bible or anything else. You've got to have something they can read and understand and that they will read. I mean, this also also goes back to grade level. You can translate in various different grade Amen. levels, and and this is part of what you really have to look at because most people you're talking about in these situations are not college graduates, and even if they were, they were not very literary, English oriented, or whatever. And if you are, if you're dealing with a, a, a translation that's operating at a college level, you're going to lose a lot that's of right. people. And so you kind of, you can say, dummy it down, whatever. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you just have to choose simpler words in a translation, um, kind of paraphrase it to be able, because some, you throw a big word out there, especially there's, our, our texts are full of religious type words that if you are in the know, you understand right. that. Justification, okay, go out there and tell me how many people can really give you a good meaning of justification. 
And what it means. Sanctification. These words that we find That's in right. our translation. We just use them just. We use them time. like they're nothing, right. but to the average person, they have no clue what you just said. Yeah. You you know, I'm, what, right I'm sorry, but now you're into my territory when you're talking about readability and grade, grade level reading. I never really thought about it, so I did a quick thing. I found a translation grade level uh, configuration. You really, if you're, you know, sixth grade is high for yeah. somebody. Yeah. If you're on third or fourth, maybe. King James is over 12th grade now. Yeah. RSV, 12th grade. NASB, 11. ESV, which we love, is 10th grade. Um, I don't even recognize it. The, I, there is a third grade reading level, and I think it's that new century version. I'm not sure what it is. But that was interesting. You just yeah. said that. I'm like, yeah. you can't, yeah. can't read it. Yeah. yeah, but you have to, that, that automatically throws in, okay, well, who who actually made that translation? Right. Because, you know, we all carry our own doctrinal prejudices, and somebody who sits down and does say, I really want this to come across that a third grader could read this, that's, yeah, a, that's, true. that's a noble idea, mm -hmm. but, you know, if that person happens to be Catholic, mm -hmm there's a really good chance that it's not going to be true to the text mm -hmm. and that the meaning of your s subsequent translation, which is usually just a transliteration, I mean, they're taking mm -hmm. another version and turning it into their Bible, and that we have that inaccuracies that get injected into pretty much every version of the Bible that somebody injects their own personal doctrinal issues. And you know, it's always referred to in the King James Version that the word baptism was not translated. The word baptism was transliterated right. because they didn't want to say immersion. Right. So when Alexander Campbell made his version of the Bible, you know, he injected the word immersion and right. not baptism because that was the actual translation. Or the word deacon, which means servant. Mm -hmm. you know, we, that dekoinos word in Greek is not an English word until 1611 when they decided that that was, a, that was kind of an office in the church, so we need to give it a name, and they give it the word deacon as opposed to servant. And, you know, so we, we should be aware, you know, we're, we're all being a little led by the nose without even knowing. That's right because of that. So. You, all, you also have, and this is something that people don't, don't like to own up to, but over the broad swipe of the population, not everyone can do algebra, and lots of people cannot do calculus, and there is some algebra and calculus in That's the right. text. That's okay? right. I'm sorry, but it's just the way that it is. is. Very true. So this is the last thought I had. I wanted to jump to it now because I want to remind us of this. It's not a rule book. It's a, it's a book of wisdom. If the idea is to get wisdom from it rather than boom, boom, boom. Number one. And number two is, we already mentioned, so rather than going to just one version, seeing a multiplicity of versions uh, and looking at that helps a lot. So, we have a couple of repeat, repeat slides. I don't interpret. I just read scripture. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And then interpretation. They're original storytellers, copies, editors, who decided the 27 books. Most reliable documents of all the fragments we have, translators. We choose our specific scriptures that we want to focus on, and so forth. So, if we look at all these, then I'm going to show you. And this is this is editorial. This is Jerry. All right. I like the NIV. That's thought for thought, and I like the ESV, and that's more word for word. So, a combination of those. Um, I don't know where NIV was on your reading level, but. Uh, pretty high. Yeah, so RSV is not even listed up there, and that's also one of my preferences, and you did say that's 11th grade, so I mean, that's just my, that's just who I am. But also I like the message. Now, the message is very, very good for getting a big picture of what's going on. Now, don't go to that for absolute scriptures, <laughs> but to get a big picture of what's going on is, is good. I like the King James Version. Wow, how strange you are. Yeah, you know what? I grew up in the King James Version. Memorable. And so there's a lot of elegance there. There's a lot of, as you say, memorization. For example, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leadeth me into... Paths of righteousness. So that, you know, blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of ungodly, nor sitteth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of scorn. You don't find that poeticness in other ones. And so there are good things about it. 
And so I, I don't want us to, to, to forget and, and just throw it all out. So I got a couple of hands up. So one. I didn't have any. Uh, who, somebody over Not this time. Uh, yeah. uh, so um, I think one of the problems with some of the translations is they, they tend to, well, I guess one question you could ask is, how does truth present itself? And we in the West tend to privilege, you know, a kind of uh, syllogistic, uh, linear kind of truth that forms of like a really good argument. But if you look at like um, the like the bulk of the Bible was poetic, right. and yeah. we tend to downplay the nature of poetic truth as though it's well, hundred years ago they called it womanly, which was an insult because women weren't capable of, of reasoning. <laughs> And that it's somehow lesser. This goes back to Plato, through Descartes, where, and that's our intellectual tradition in the West. Yeah. And but it turns out that truth is, it can be presented in, in a poetic way that's not just more rigorous and can unfold it, itself in significant ways. In other words, there's more signification. In other words, it has to do with science because everything's language. Uh, but that. It, at the same time, can uh, appeal in an understandable way to lesser educated, and I think that's the yeah. reason why the 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 Jesus spoke in parables so much, but also there's so much po poetry and song throughout the Bible. So I want to just point out what he has just said. Tie that back to last Sunday. Bias. You know, it, it's a bias. It's the it's the focus. It's the lens you to look through. What you said. Yes, Tom. Uh -oh. Back in 1968, when I started freeing, I was in uh, the library trying to study, and but I needed another version. And I'm, I'm not making this up. There was a lady. She's 900 years old to me, but she was she was one of the librarians. And I said something to her about getting a different version. No, you need to use the King James. She exactly. won't. And uh, everybody says this, but I've got what well, their version. Yeah. If the King James is good enough for Paul, it's good enough for That's me. right. That is right. That is right. <laughs> you know, and I see the one I'm reading this. I try to change every year. The one okay. The and that's a good. And that's but a good. I always, this is terrible. Now I'll ask y'all. Usually I send it to Andrew and say, "Hey, what do you think about this one?" I'm reading the Christian Standard Bible, which is right there, and I, I wondered what that was. See, right there, thought for thought. That's yeah. the one my reading is. And so if people look at my Bible and go, "Well, she's never read it before." Well, that's right in that version. So <laughs> lots of notes. All right. You can see how you could like thank this and instead of just picking out one is that you know yeah. as as you grow as a Christian, yeah. you probably should move from a paraphrased exactly. version and move to more of a word to word right. version because yeah. you have grown. Yeah, that's right. You, know, you, you you've made progress in your ability to manage some of these abstract thoughts that having a better language understanding can be really helpful in your continued growth. But I will say, you know, I, I told you I like King James and message, but then I put a red on King James and New King James and so I, I, I'm less interested in those today. But still, I mean but you also again, have to be careful when you use multiple translations that you don't do what I see a lot of people do. Picking picking the one that That's you want exactly right. No, even within a given verse Picking certain words out of one translation that you quote unquote like because it yeah. goes along with what you believe yeah. or what you've kind of been told or yeah. what you've come to already have presupposed before you even went to the text. And you pick one word out of this translation, you go over and you pick another word out of this translation for a different part, and before you know it, you clobber together something that in the original <laughs> language did not exist. And it becomes so, Robert McClure's translation well, or it's Jared it's Kirk's translation or whatever, right? You know, if you want to do that, go back and learn some Hebrew, go back and learn yeah, some Greek. Exactly. But that's not a simplistic thing to do either. So. Exactly. All right, let's go on. Let's talk about some corruptions. So how did we get these books that shows and put in there in the canon? Of course, canon means rule, measuring stick. Criteria of the real objectionable books like Song of Solomon. <clears throat> How did he get in there? And then uh, why were some things like Maccabees and Ezra and Thomas and whatever left out in there? Why do we have four Gospels, four accounts of the Gospels and not less or, or even not even more? So all these things. But let's look at one. I'm going to look at a couple of them in particular. So let's look at Mark 
chapter 16. We've alluded to that several times throughout this series already. So now we're going to jump into it and dive into it a lot deeper. So this ending of Mark, uh, this, is, uh, th this is from the Sparks film that I've got. Uh, the Mark ending, there are four different variations. Uh, in the, in, these are, by the way, in the handout that you have. And uh, so, uh, but in the first three, one, two, and three, there's no snakes, there's no poison, and there's no commission. You know, so if, if you stop at verse 8, and you don't have to worry about answering the, the problem about snakes and poison, but guess what? The commission's not in there either. But if you look at the last, uh, it's in A, C, and D. Well, we're going to get that after this comes up, but the, the first top three are in the number one and number two of of the old versions that we have, but the last one is in the other three. So, which one's correct? And uh, all those, also, I have to mention this. There are discrepancies in this chart. Not anything about particularly what we're talking about, but they, this chart lists 99 and 112 in both 2 and 4. What a king. So, I don't know. So, there are discrepancies in, in the chart that I chose. So, but this... Um, no poisons, no snakes, no commission up there. And then at the bottom, all this others. Now you have going to all the world, praying, proclaiming the gospel, and so forth, and so baptizing. So that's in there. So that's just a big overview look at it. And again, this is in the handout that I gave out the first week. So look at the pros and cons of these. So against the latter part being in there, well, the Vatican and the Sinaitic manuscripts, very best Unshules that we have, uh, they don't have it. But, as I say, the others do. There's a host of them that do have it. But whichever view is correct, it's important to note that the truthfulness of the passage is not in dispute as the main events of the passage are recorded elsewhere. And the big thing is, and this was mentioned in the preacher's workshop, we just studied Mark in the preacher's workshop and this was brought out, don't make this a stance of, you believe this way, and I believe this way, and so we can't be brethren. Don't make it a contentious uh, matter. You believe one, I believe another, that's okay. That's okay. So, so possible explanations for the long ending. Uh, there's three possible explanations that I found. I don't know, I didn't record where I got this, so I don't know where it came from. Uh, the author intensely ended the gospel here in an open-ended fashion, or it was just never finished, or the last leap of the manuscript was lost prior to copy. So if you take the first one, ended in an open-ended fashion, uh, the probability of the gospel was written on a scroll rather than a codex, or it just wasn't completed, or the literary ending of the gospel was so abruptly that the readers are now drawn into the story itself. The readers must ask themselves, what do I do with Jesus if I don't accept His suffering? I don't see His glory. So, I mean, all these are things that people said may be a possible explanation for various endings. So, it, it amazes me as many pieces from here and pieces from there and stuff like this. How we even, and I know there's divine intervention, but still, it's it blows my mind to think that all these things from different parts and then they come together. And guess what? They're one. Yeah. Yeah, maybe be stayed a little bit different, yeah. but there was. So the next thing I want to look at is as you look at these, uh, when we're going to go to John a John seven fifty three or through eight eleven, uh, the uh, Beze is that the way you pronounce that? Beze, Beze. Uh, depends on how that e vowels. Uh, is the only manuscript that's found uh, that you find John eight. So let's look at this now a little bit. So uh, it's missing from all of these, but and then uh, Lightfoot says that it's also missing from A, C, and D. So it's missing from all of them except for uh, B. But there are internal problems with it being put here. If you put, if you're going to put it at John chapter seven, verse fifty-three, the vocabulary is different. And there are also interruptions in the flow of text. So, I mean, if you just leave that out, and then the text just flows normally. And so it's inserted, so it kind of makes it an interruption. 
to the flow of text. But also it's a floating text. Now, Dwayne's mentioned this earlier. It's a floating text, and Dwayne says it's after Luke. Uh, it's most, it, it, it was a good find, chance he's after Luke. It, you find it in some other places. And so yeah, so, I mean, and I've listed all those that <laughs> potential places that you can find it. So it is a floating text. What that tells me, I mean, I may be wrong, but it's probably good text. It's just that it doesn't fit in this particular location. It was, th it was things that were going around at the time that people were talking about, and so it, let, let's find a place to put it. it it's, it's probably a free flow in Jesus saying it's a story that was out there, maybe even in written form in some other places, and it didn't make it initially into right. one of the Gospels. Yeah. But it's out there, and so let's stick it somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, it is a, it's the story of the woman caught in adultery. That's right. Yeah. Hey, yeah, we should talk so about what, this is, what a, this is. Right? This is a text that we all... Jesus knelt on the ground. and We're just going to throw that out? Man, that don't even belong in Scripture. But it's literally found in original, I mean, not original, but Greek manuscripts, yeah. early Greek manuscripts stuck in Luke. Yes. Yeah. So it's not like it's unfounded that it would be in Luke. And I think it's a great opportunity, and it's probably for people in this class, is that... It's it's a good way to introduce yourself to what critical what critical thought about scripture mm -hmm. is, is because if you take that verse and you read John chapter seven and you get to verse fifty two and then you jump to eight twelve, it's an uninterrupted time. Right. I mean it just seems like it just goes that way. Yeah. And then you get this story that's stuck in there, and it's not that it doesn't fit, but you know the story, so you're immediately sort of like for not thinking about it, you're thinking about the specifics of the story. You're not thinking about the critical context of this passage. And I think the same thing about an introduction to free thinking a little bit is to say the same thing about First Peter and Second Peter. So if you just take, if you don't know anything about textual criticism and you read Peter, First Peter, and then you read Second Peter and tell me you really think that was written by the same person. Mm -hmm. Or read first Second Peter and then read Jude and tell me that that might not be written by the same person. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the language is the same. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, a, it's an interesting study for you as you go through this to get that idea that these questions are for real. Yeah. And, and they're not, ne some of them are mysterious, but these two specifically, um, comparison of First and Second Peter and John chapter 7, 53 through 8, 11, that those are great opportunities for you to sort of see why this discussion really matters exactly. and that you can be prepared if somebody ever asks you about that because most of the people that would ask you, well, what about John 7, 53? You know, that's not actually in the Bible. Uh, those people that are asking those questions usually are way less smart than you are. And they're kind of like baiting you in reality. But if you know anything about it, you know, you, can, you, you already know more than they do. And I think it is good to arm yourself with exactly. the, for those yeah. questions. And another thing I want to say is, um, wow, well, yeah, I, I came back to it, is I'm not, I'm not a, heretic, a heretic from asking questions like this. We should be, that was the first lesson, critical thinking. We should be critical thinkers and think about, and, and as you say, really be ready to arm ourselves for questions that come our way. Because if we aren't, then we just look like fools. Yeah. And most of the time, this stuff doesn't make that much difference. There are yeah. some, though, that there are a few verses <coughs> that put a lot of stock in that have some arguability as interpolation. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 has a legitimate arguability as it is an insertion by someone who is thinking that, and it's a relatively early insertion, but there is a little bit of manuscriptual evidence to suggest that it is. Gordon Fee is a big proponent of this. This is talking about women being silent, okay? Mm -hmm. We're, and we put a lot of stock on that verse, okay? We lift that right up to the very top of, mm -hmm. of a lot of things that we do and think it is an absolute commandment uh, that uh, we disfellowship and everything else people for. But, uh, so another one, and I, I wasn't going down this path, but we kind of started, so let me just tell you another one. Another one that's listed on that list of things is Acts 8.37. What does that say? Do you believe? Are you willing to confess, <laughs> uh, eunuch? And then I can baptize you. And so 
We do that today. I know we do. Every time somebody's baptized, we so we ask them to stand up. But it very well may not have been in there. That doesn't mean confessing is not important. Matthew 10, 32. Uh, Romans 10. Uh, you know, confessing Jesus, but it's not a one and done deal. <laughs> we need to be confessing Jesus daily. But well, we like that. First yeah. thing is like it, it's like the like Philip is asking the Ethiopian yeah. to make this statement. Yeah. And so in verse 37, he makes the right. statement, which is right. I believe that Jesus And so is it a good thing? God. Yeah. But may it may that verse not have been in the original? Possible. Of course. In our tradition, we make a Walter Scott, you know, there are that five things of the fist that you have to yeah. right? Yeah. You've got to do here, believe, and ask, right. repent, you baptize, and then continue to live a faithful mm -hmm. life. I see it on bulletin boards drawn up here. And you have to jump from here to there to there to there to there to put that together. Okay. So, does anybody read NET? NET on anybody's list? <coughs> it, no, NET. No, uh, I don't need it. I like NET. Okay. So, it was over toward that end of word for word type thing. So, Daniel Wallace is the editor of the NET, and he says that we at the NET took that whole John 7, 8, 11 out because it just didn't belong, and we took it out. Hmm. And our sales plummeted. <laughs> So we put it back in. But when we put it back in, we did things like making the font size smaller so it's harder to read from a pulpit, <laughs> all this stuff. <laughs> so you know the I mean, same that's the bias that we have. With the RSV, when the RSV came out in 1959, you know, it basically had the passage in Isaiah chapter 7, which says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive the yeah. law. And they it, they translated that as they felt like it should be, which says, and a young woman right. will conceive, mm -hmm. and uh, the same thing happened to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, they didn't change their mind, but uh, they, they had that sales problem of, of that, especially amongst Catholics that were like, there's no way we're going to read this, you know, corrupted passage in the Bible. So there are some corrected, uh, uh, Corrected corrections. Well, that's strange terminology. Translations. There are some. There are some translations that have been corrected. So, I need to correct this slide. <laughs> uh, the comma uh, Jahanian is really uh, the, the Trinity pushing the Trinity. So, you know, do you believe in Jesus the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost all as one? And do we? Yes. But uh, it the was not listed the father the son the holy spirit was not listed in the original greek king james says for there bear witness of these three in heaven and earth in heaven the father the word the holy ghost and these three are one and they bear witness in the earth and so the bear can... to the whole lesson if you would go on thursday night and the word trinity is not even in the bible yeah exactly it's, it's not do i believe it yeah i think Dwayne mentioned it last sunday uh you know yeah but are you are you know i think that Thing about the Trinity doctrine, and we talk about this forever too. Yeah. But I mean, you know, the reality is is that we've adopted that, and and uh, almost would say you're a heretic yes. if you don't right. believe that the Holy Spirit is equal to God. First of all, that's kind of weird to think about, but um, you know, find that in Scripture. Somewhere. Yeah, but we are nice telling Christians. We are nice seeing. We Christians. are. But what did Jesus we say about God? What did Jesus say about his relationship to yeah, God? Well, he said the Father is greater there is than a, God. There is a subordinate relationship that you see in the text itself. Some, some text counters that, John and things like yeah. that. But in the pre-Nicene time, they just chopped your head off. Yes, um, you know, there are they, plenty of were, early, early, early church uh, fathers that pre-Nicene that were clearly subordinations than what they thought was <clears throat> as far as the rank order of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's a derived theological doctrine that we ascribe to and we go to bat for that I'm not so sure of the text read in its purest form actually totally supports. I'm pretty okay with having that be a mystery. Exactly. Exactly. It's okay for exactly. us to not understand. So, so the NET says in, in their footnotes regarding this that it seems to be have risen from a homily in the 4th century Latin. So homily is what? Sermon. sermon. So homily is just a sermon. So there was a sermon and it, 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 most likely it came from that 
copies of the Latin Vulgate it got in there, then it got into the Roman Catholic Church, and then we had the Nicene Creed, and then all this kind of stuff, and then because of the pressure from the Catholic Church. Uh, but how can you argue that that should be in any manuscript before the 1500s? And yeah, uh, I think so uh, 14, it says 14th century. So you think about that. Did not appear in the, the 14th century in any Greek manuscript. Right. Right. And so that's essentially been corrected. Uh, this translation has been right. corrected. I'm sorry, I'm attending the Thursday night with David Morrison. We, boy, we get into details on these words. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing what you're saying there because it just goes. In. And he asked me, he began by saying, How many of you were taught the Trinity when you grew up? Mm -hmm. And across the street. Yeah. 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 So, uh, propagandists purporting the KVG, the KV, KJV. Uh, so, this is, this. I've already brought this up. And this is just pure bias. So let's look at it. There's four, four specific problems with the King James Version. And you say, uh, oh, well, but 20 years ago, 20 years ago, it was a big thing. And, and earlier than that, in 1968, Tony found out. And there are churches even today that the only, way, only thing you can read from the pulpit is the, KV, the King James Version and maybe NAS, NASB maybe. So, I mean, so, uh, it was referenced. So, the source has a problem. Uh, the uh, textus receptus, or the received word, uh, had uh, translations coming from, some of them from Latin, because they didn't have all the original to start with. And uh, there is the date of translation, and all the things that we have beyond that, that we now know, that we can apply properly. And then there's there was a third one in there. I skipped that one because it didn't make sense to me. But the fourth one was vocabulary. I mean, look at this. Doeth he, thank ye, that, whatever. All right? I mean, that's old hey, archaic hey, language. Hey, man, upgrade yeah, yeah. In 1611. But if you look at these terms, for example, I'll just give you a, a few examples. A mean man. Uh, common meaning uh, in 1611 was a common man. Well, today it's a cruel man. Uh, I mean, meat, any kind of food. Well, today it's just flesh. So you look at all these, and so as you read this today, and if you teach Diane, somebody who is a third grade level, uh, who don't know anything about Scripture, and what are you talking about? And so taking the King James Version and teaching a non-churched person today, I mean, it's, it's very, very difficult. So there are lots of things about the King James Version uh, here, uh, NASB, NASB following the Masoretic text compared to ESV following the, what's LXX? Septuagint. So look at the difference there. So there are, there are differences. And of course the Septuagint is the one that the church, not the church fathers, the apostles used much of the times. And we even said maybe uh, Jesus. So, so there are extra verses found. Uh, we've kind of gone through that already. And... Uh, and that and all that is uh, bias. Yet, the King James Version served us well for its time. It was a masterpiece in the English language. Uh, scholar, devotion, piety, uh, English language was vigorous and young, and scholars had a remarkable mastery of the instrument which Providence had prepared for them, and it's justifiably been called the noblest dot mock monument of English prose. But that, that could kind of go back to people being illiterate and the people that were teaching them. That's a very good point. Whatever That's a very good point. To. And, and to me, Listen to what I tell you. Yeah, they have to, you know, they're not supposed to yeah. interpret the Bible or say yeah. it's wherever we take this. From. That's a great point. Incredible influence of the King James Version. Uh, it became an enduring mo a monument of English prose because of its gracious style, majestic language, poetic rhythms, no other book has had such a tremendous influence on the English literature, and no other translation has touched the lives of so many English-speaking people for centuries. So, don't bash the King James Version. But don't take it as gospel, and that's the only thing. That's the point that I want to make. That's the point that I think that we should take a look at it. Don't go to the King James and look, this is what it says, boom, forevermore. But at the same time, there's a lot of beauty and poetry there for a more, I guess we've determined, to a 12th grade level, for a more intellectual 
uh, audience. So, which one should I use? Use the translation that you will read, and as we've mentioned in this class, maybe even a multiplicity of translations to uh, to bounce off of. Uh, so, um, but also know that all translations are interpretations. There is no such thing as a word for word translation. Use the Bible that fits your goal, study, memorization, memorization, reading. Use the Bible that you will actually use. And read multiple versions when studying. That's class. Any comments? Yes, Tom. I just got in my mind about what something you said about, you know, we believe this way, we don't want to talk, we don't want to change, something mm -hmm. like that. There was a little article, I don't know where it came from, Reader Digest or what, but it was a guy that ran a clothing store, <clears throat> I mean, a, uh, for, uh, what am I trying to say? Cloth store. And when he died, he, there was an old ruler there, yardstick, and so somebody was going to replace it. And they said, do you know your yardstick's only 35 inches long? So in essence, he had been cheating people out of me. <laughs> you know, and, but they didn't want to change it because that's what my daddy used. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 and, and picking on our people a little bit, I just feel like, you know, as most of us are Church of Christ born and raised, and the that confidence we have in our ability and the confidence that we have in other people's ability and how we utilize that information to warn over people. And as you talked about this today, I was thinking about Floyd Wallace and how he influenced the church in the 1950s and 60s. That, you know, he wrote a book about basically condemning all modern, right. modern translations. Yes. But one of the quotes of his mentor, who was out of Texas, he said that, I'm not searching for the truth. I have the truth. And, and we I need to make sure that we don't do that. Absolutely. And I said and listened to that man as a young child as we traveled. He scared me to death. I thought he was going to come down the aisle and get in me. Not very serious. But I agree with you, Dwight. We need to be careful. Absolutely. I've got the truth. I don't need to learn anymore. I'm not going to change. Yeah, I see sheets. Careful. Careful. Are we growing? The quote that I gave last week, are we looking at Scripture to prove what we already know, or are we trying to grow? I think the statement made, though, is to have that mentality that I can figure it out in yeah. a way that I can go figure out exactly. Yeah. And there isn't a lot of ambiguity. <laughs> that's what some people say. It all, it's all about your heart. And that's the modernity mindset. The enlightenment mindset. Thank you.